Harvard students. Okay, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce you to the biliary tree. We're going to go over cholecystitis, hepatitis. Um, I'll kind of compare and contrast uremia versus end stage liver failure because the signs and symptoms are really mostly the same. Okay, cirrhosis and pancreatitis. So we're going to start here on the um, with the organs and where they're located in the abdominal cavity because this is going to help you um, understand where the pain and the conditions we're going to be talking about is usually located. Okay, so the liver and the gallbladder are in the right upper quadrant. The gallbladder is tucked under the liver, and I have another picture to show you that um, shows it a little bit better below. However, what I want to point out that is if somebody has pain in the right upper quadrant with radiation to the shoulder, the right shoulder, because that often happens, um, they probably have either a liver problem like early cirrhosis or a gallbladder problem, especially after uh, eating fatty foods. So to reiterate, if they have pain in the right upper quadrant, it's going to be due to a liver problem or a gallbladder problem. The other liver problem would be if somebody had liver trauma. The liver receives a lot of blood per minute, like 1,500 mLs per minute. That means there's a lot of blood in that liver. So if somebody has like a motor vehicle accident and they get a liver laceration, they could bleed out and they would have pain in their right shoulder, okay, um, and in the right upper quadrant. All right, now moving down to the right lower quadrant, this is um, your ascending colon, and people that have pain in the right lower quadrant um, may have appendicitis. So there's a you can see I drew a little star here. This is called McBurney's point. So if somebody has pain or tenderness on palpation, and this would be the provider would elicit this, and, um, it means they could mean they have appendicitis. If we move up into the left upper quadrant, now the stomach is in the left upper quadrant. The, uh, the uh, spleen is behind the stomach. And so if somebody has trauma and they have a splenetic uh, rupture, they're going to have pain in the left upper quadrant in the left shoulder. It's called refer pain, referred pain when the pain is somewhere where the organ's not. So they would have referred pain there. Now moving down to the left lower quadrant, you've got your descending colon and your sigmoid colon. People with diverticul uh, diverticulitis present with pain in the left lower quadrant of their abdomen. And if you scroll down, you can see the biliary tree. So the biliary tree includes the liver, the gallbladder. So again, these are on the right side. So people with problems with um, problems in these areas, the pain is going to be in the right upper quadrant with referred pain to the right shoulder. Okay, and then with the pancreas, the pancreas is one of those organs. It's kind of like in the um, in the mid epigastric area to the left upper quadrant. So people with pancreatitis present with left upper quadrant pain and uh, or mid epigastric pain, and they can have radiation to the shoulder as well. Okay, now this little drawing I made of the gallbladder in the liver and the pancreas is not to scale, obviously. Um, and I'm not an artist, but I just wanted to show you like the relationship between the gallbladder, liver, and the pancreas, because this will help you on exams to kind of understand the signs and symptoms people are going to have. Okay, so this is the gallbladder right here. The gallbladder's job is to store and release bile when we need it. So that would be after a, eating a fatty meal, okay? So what happens is the gallbladder stores about 50 mLs of bile. 
Um, and when you eat a fatty meal, it starts to contract. And it's going to, um, the bile will travel through the cystic duct. It'll meet the hepatic duct and then flow into, this is the common bile duct, okay? So that's what gives um, our stool the color and um, <clears throat> helps us digest fatty meals, okay? Um, then the liver is what makes the bile, and this obviously isn't a scale because the liver is bigger than the gallbladder, but the liver makes the bile. And when it makes the bile, it travels down the hepatic duct into the cystic duct to be stored in the gallbladder. Now, if there are stones, okay, so somebody has gallstones. Now, the name, the medical term for gallstones is cholelithiasis, and I have it right up here. So that means somebody has gallstones. We, we could all have gallstones, and it, it's not a problem if it's, the patient's not having problems with it. We could, you could have a gallstone. We could have gallstones. Um, it becomes a problem when the gallstones, when the gallbladder contracts, the gallstones are going to start coming out of the cystic duct, right? It becomes, so it, doing this over and over can result in inflammation of the gallbladder inflammation of the gallbladder is called cholecystitis and you're going to need to know who's at risk and you can remember who's at risk by learning the six F's. So they are fair so this means Caucasian people. They are fat this means people with a BMI greater than 30. They are 40 so that means somebody over 40. They are female so uh, estrogen is a risk factor for cholecystitis. So especially people that are have, had just had a baby or multiparous, um, people on birth control pills, okay, so they're going to be at risk. Uh, family, it runs in family, so there is a genetic component to cholecystitis. And then fertile, again, that speaks to the estrogen, okay? So examples would be people that are pregnant, people that also people that eat a high fat diet are going to be at risk because that's going to make the gallbladder contract a lot. And if they have gallstones, they could, um, it starts to irritate the gallbladder. Um, people with A1Cs greater than six are going to be at risk for cholecystitis. All right. So. Again, because the gallbladder is in the right upper quadrant, they're going to have pain in the right upper quadrant or radiation to the shoulder, especially after eating high-fat food. So that's kind of a clue. Somebody eats some delicious McDonald French fries, and then they end up with pain in their right upper quadrant or radiation to the shoulder. I'm going to think they have cholecystitis. Um, they're going to have a temp because cholecystitis is, is inflammation of the gallbladder. They'll have a high WBC count because there's inflammation of the gallbladder. They will also have rebound tenderness uh, of their abdomen and something called Murphy sign, which the provider or, you know, a physician, nurse practitioner will elicit when they palpate. So Murphy sign means cholecystitis. Some of the abdom um, GI symptoms that somebody with cholecystitis is going to have is nausea and vomiting, eructication, which means burping, uh, flatulence, which I think you know what that means. So anyways, the treatment is going to be a lap cole, uh, usually. Sometimes they have to do an open cole, and I talk about that in the cholecystitis lectures, but usually it's a lap cole is going to be the treatment. Okay, now, if somebody gets a biliary stone, a bili, a, common, a stone in the common bile duct, that's called cholelithiasis. Okay, so that can be treated with, it can be diagnosed and treated with an ERCP. Okay, but what I want you to know about that, what's important about that, is if there's a stone in the common bile duct, Okay, the liver 
is plugging along, making the bile, and trying to in releasing the bile, right? But it's obstructed. So the, the bile becomes obstructive, and then the patient, the liver gets really stressed out when this happens. And so when the liver is stressed, it releases the enzymes. So you're going to see an increase in the ALT, the AST, the alkaline phosphatate. Okay, and the bilirubin is going to be high. Remember, anything over 1.1. So Kathy Parks used to say, I gave Billy $1 for a Reuben sandwich. Okay, you'll get um, labs on your NCLEX and also on your exams. All right, so if this happens, signs of biliary obstruction, and it, it doesn't matter how it happens, if they have cancer, if they have a biliary stone, these are the signs and symptoms you're going to see with biliary obstruction. Okay, so remember those labs. This is the bilirubin is going to make the patient jaundice and they'll have icterus, which means um, yellowing of the sclera of the eye. They're going to be really itchy. Okay, they're going to have burning skin and you might see like extreme excoriations on their skin. They're going to have clay colored stools because bilirubin is what gives the stool its color or bile, I should say, bile and bilirubin. Uh, dark foamy urine, um, they will have that and intolerance to high fatty foods. Okay. Now, people with cholecystitis can also get severe biliary colic. So your signs and symptoms are going to be like shock-like. They'll have tachycardia, they'll be pale, they'll be diaphoretic. Uh, they'll have extreme prostration, which means that they will have extreme tiredness. That's what that means, like exhaustion. Um, and this could result in shock. So you're going to call your rapid, okay, and stay with the patient. Put the bed flat. Anytime um, somebody's blood pressure drops or you think they're at risk for shock-like vital signs, you're going to put the bed flat. You can elevate the legs a little bit, but that's the nursing intervention for that. So you're going to need to give IV fluids and don't give opioids or sedatives until a patient is examined by a provider. Okay, so again, now if somebody has a gallstone and it's blocking the pancreatic duct, okay, they're going to have signs of biliary obstruction that I just went over and signs of pancreatitis, okay? So in addition to having the liver enzymes elevated, okay, and the signs and symptoms of a biliary obstruction, they will also have an elevated lipase and amylase. And this will make more sense to you when we go over pancreatitis. Um, the two most common causes of pancreatitis is alcohol abuse and uh, biliary obstruction. So you know it's biliary obstruction if they have these signs and symptoms of biliary obstruction in addition to the elevated lipase and amylase. All right, um, moving on, we're going to talk about cholecystitis right now. Okay, so again, there is um, the biliary system. I kind of already went over all this, and this might help you because my drawing's not that good. So here is the common hepatic duct, and it meets the cystic duct, and here's the common bile duct. So remember, any obstruction of stones here is going to stress out the liver, and you're going to have those signs of biliary obstruction. Okay? And if the stone is like down in this area, right, the patient is going to have signs of biliary obstruction plus pancreatitis, okay? So with cholecystitis, again, that's inflammation of the gallbladder. They could have calculus, um, which means with gallstones or no gallstones. And we're not going to get really that deep into the difference, um, but just know the most common cause is gallstones. Okay, those at risk for a calculus cholecystitis are going to be those like in the ICU, 
those on like are septic and hypovolemic. Okay, hormone replacement therapy, we talked about that in another video, um, and pregnant people. So they're all going to be at risk. All right, so again, um, people at risk for gallstones are people that eat a high fatty diet. Look at those french fries, look so good. So a BMI greater than 30. People that have a sedentary lifestyle, so people that aren't exercising, people that sit a lot, um, people with Crohn's disease because they're malnourished. If if somebody's malnourished, it's, it stresses our liver out and the liver starts producing more cholesterol. And so that puts some high cholesterol, puts somebody at risk for gallstones and then they can develop cholelithiasis uh, uh, and then develop uh, Coley, um, cystitis. Okay. Um, liquid protein diet, same thing. Malnutrition is going to increase your cholesterol. It stresses out the liver. All right. So again, who's at risk? People with the six Fs. So fat, 40, female, fertile, family history, and fair. Okay. So you're looking for those. People with insulin resistance, so look for an A1C greater than 6. Rapid weight loss leads to increased cholesterol, and that's going to put somebody at risk. All right. Um, alcohol is not a factor in gallbladder disease, which will be when we talk about cirrhosis and pancreatitis. And this is just a chronic. There is a chronic version of cholecystitis. Um, biliary shock. So it's shock-like symptoms somebody would um, get. Um, and this is just showing you a picture of what gallstones might look like in the common bile duct. See, so you have some in the cystic duct right here. Um, and if, so if they obstruct, remember those signs and symptoms. So with severe biliary colic, I talked about this in another video, but I'm going to go over it again. So they're going to have sinus tack. They're going to have diaphoresis. They're going to be pale as a ghost. They'll have prostration and shock-like vital signs. So look for hypotension. You're going to have to put the bed flat, call your rapid, um, and then, you know, anticipate giving fluids. But don't give any, um, you don't want to give any drugs like sedatives and narcotics. Um, and the reason is you don't want to mask pain until a provider um, comes and lays their hands on somebody's belly. Um, and that's for any kind of abdominal pain. Like if somebody comes to the ED, you don't medicate until after the surgeon um, or the physician comes and assesses the, the belly. All right. So this is cholelithiasis. So it's a gallstone in the common bile duct, and that can be deadly. So they're going to need an ERCP. They diagnose it with an ERCP. Okay, an ERCP is like a sideways scope that they put down that can view the, uh, the biliary tree, okay? And they might have to go and retrieve it. So what you'll see if somebody has uh, that, it will be like fever, jaundice, and pain in the right upper quadrant. That's kind of an emergency. But um, cholecystitis is really common, so I think on your NCLEX, you're going to have to really know cholecystitis. Um, that it happen, you know, it happens because of our uh, American standard diet that we have in America right now. So, for example, um, we if somebody does have problems with cholecystitis, they need to be on a low fat diet. They need to avoid gas producing foods. They may need to take fat-soluble vitamins because, remember, bile aids in fat digestion. So the fat-soluble vitamins need the fat digestion to be able to store these, okay? Um, and so for patients that can't have surgery, they can do an ESWL. And that's the shockwave therapy, lithotripsy. And I talked about that in the renal lecture. So it's the same nursing impl implications, okay? Um, and then they can go on, if they can't have surgery, they can go on bile dissolving, uh, stabilizing agents. 
Okay. The lap coli. This is, I think like if you're going to get uh, NCLEX questions, it's going to be about the lap coli. So I just want to point out a couple things. So they're going to have little teeny two by two incisions, right? Lap coli. So they'll have a lot of them. Um, and the provider puts gas in the peritoneum so that they can visualize the organs when they do laparoscopic surgery. So the patient is going to come to the PACU into the um, medical surgical floor with pain in the right shoulder or pain in the upper right quadrant. And the best treatment for that is to ambulate. Okay, because that's going to move the gas, especially, you know, if because the gas is going to travel up after the surgery. That's why it goes to the right upper uh, shoulder. They can use a heating pad, and within one week, this is like a really easy surgery to recover from. They can resume their normal activities. They need to eat a low-fat diet. They need to introduce fatty foods one at a time. Um, some of my friends that have had um, a cholecystectomy, um, tell me like they can't eat cheese anymore. So that's kind of depressing um, because it really it really triggers them to have diarrhea. And they need to avoid gas producing food and beverages. So that's like carbonated drinks like soda and no smoking. So the complications of an open, now they would do an open if they couldn't uh, do a lap coli. Um, it's not as common these days because the lap coli works very good. But in any case, because of where the gallbladder is and where the incisions are, people don't like to turn, cough, deep, breathe. So you're going to have to medicate them um, to make sure that they're turning, coughing, deep, breathing and using the incentive barometer. Anytime you have um, abdominal dressings okay for surgery you always want to roll the patient over to check for bleeding because if they have um, bleeding it could trickle down and you might not even notice it the the dressing could still look beautiful but the blood is trickling down and you know you never want to hear a patient say oh my back feels wet right you got to roll the patient over and check for bleeding all right so if they have an open cholecystectomy with exploration of the common bile duct, um, they're going to have JPs and make sure, remember your JPs are to self-suction, so they need to be compressed to work. So make sure you do that. Now, if they have this with an open cholecystectomy, they'll get what's called a T-tube. And a T-tube is put in the common bile duct and it's going to stay in until the common bile duct inflammation subsides. So it's going to go to a drainage collection. You have to keep it dependent just like you would like a Foley, right? Um, and you're going to have, it's going to drain bile. So bile is this cold, like a golden brown color. Okay, so that's important to know. You're never going to irrigate or aspirate a tube without an order. That goes for the uh, nephrostomy tubes as well that we talked about in renal. Uh, by, your liver produces 500 to 1,000 mLs of bile per day, and that's what you can expect out of a T-tube um, for them to, um, you know, produce. Okay, so the best indicators after somebody's had surgery of the return of peristalsis is flatus or a BM, not bowel sounds. And everybody needs to quit smoking. Okay, so this might speak to some people. I'm going to go through cholecystitis again. Okay, so people that like are read-write people. So again, um, people who are at risk, remember the six F's that I went over with. So fair, Caucasian, fat means a BMI greater than 30, 40 means people over 40, females, um, especially fertile females or females on estrogen are going to be high risk for gallbladder disease. Um, family tendency, so it does run in families. So examples, females with on um, birth control pills. P females who are pregnant, females who just had twins, okay? So think of those 
kind of incidences. Uh, anybody on a liquid diet, especially if they're um, trying to avoid carbohydrates. Um, anybody with rapid weight loss, anybody with a BMI greater than 30 or an A1C greater than 6. Okay. Um, alcohol is not a factor in gallbladder disease. And the reason I'm telling you that that is because it is in cirrhosis and pancreatitis. People can have cholecystitis without gallstones, but you, I think that you're going to be tested mostly on um, cholecystitis with gallstones. So it can be acute or chronic. It could have stones or no stones. But in, in general, the signs and symptoms are going to be pretty much the same. So they'll have inflammation of the gall, uh, gallbladder. Now, the signs and symptoms include pain in the right upper quadrant or radiation to the shoulder, especially after eating high fat foods. They're going to have a temperature because the gallbladder is going to be inflamed. They'll have a high white count because the gallbladder is inflamed. They're going to have rebound tenderness. The provider would do, uh, elicit that on palpation. They'll have something called Murphy sign. And the provider elicits this on deep palpation on inspiration. And they get very tender in that area. So if you see something that says Murphy sign, that means cholecystitis. They will, the GI symptoms they're going to have include nausea and vomiting, eructication, which is burping, and flatulence. They'll feel anorexic, so they could feel full. Um, it's going to be diagnosed, diagnosed with an ECRP, e uh, uh, MRCP, which is like an a MRI of the biliary tree, HIDA scan, and an ultrasound is probably going to be the first line because it's non-invasive of the right upper quadrant. So they would um, treat this with a cholecystectomy. Okay. If somebody has severe biliary colic, they're going to have shock-like vital signs. So. They'll have sinus tack, they're going to be pale, they're going to be diaphoretic, they're going to have extreme fatigue or prostration is what that's called. So you're going to try to prevent shock, so put the bed flat, call your rapid, stay with your patient, anticipate the need for IV fluids, and do not give opioids or sedatives until the provider has evaluated the patient. Um, treatment for gallbladder like cholecystitis is going to be a lap coli, an open coli, an ESWL, remember that's the shock uh, treatment, lithotripsy, that we talked about in the renal lecture, same nursing implications, okay? Um, they could, uh, some people that cannot undergo surgery may be giving bile dissolving agents, okay? <clears throat> and they could put on a biliary catheter um, if they need to. I wouldn't worry too much about that. We're going to talk mostly about lap coli and open coli. Um, so coli docolithiasis is just a stone in the common bile. I don't mean to say just a stone in the common bile duct because it can be deadly, okay? Because it can end up in coli anginous. I want you to stick to um, the acute cholecystitis though because that's what I think you're going to be most tested on on NCLEX. All right, so, however, I do want you to know this because um, if the common bile duct gets obstructed, okay, with a stone, you're going to have elevated LFTs and an elevated bilirubin, which is going to cause, an elevated bilirubin is going to cause jaundice and icterus, which is uh, yellowing of the sclera. It's going to cause burning and itching of the skin. And I have other pictures I'm going to show you of what, how, how bad it's itching when you see how people scratch themselves silly because it's so itchy. Okay, they'll have clay colored stools because the bile is what gives our stools the color. They're going to have dark foamy urine and an intolerance to high fatty foods.
They may have steatorrhea, which are those fatty stools that smell rancid, and fever. Okay, now the diet that you're going to encourage somebody with cholecystitis is low fat, high fiber, avoid gas producing foods, and drinks like sodas, don't drink with a straw, and they may need fat soluble vitamins and bile, um, bile salts. Okay. So again, the most common treatment is going to be that lap coli, and I talked about that in another uh, lecture, so I would definitely <clears throat> pay attention to that. Okay, now I'm going to go switch into the liver, and the first thing we're going to talk about is hepatitis. And for hepatitis, okay, I want you to remember there are five types. We're only going to talk about three because the other types happen in other countries, okay? So I'm just going to talk about what's prevalent in the United States. So if you can remember A is for a bad word that begins with the letter A, you can remember that hepatitis A is transmitted by the fecal oral route, okay? So this comes on you know, they have the whatever they caught it from, and then within two to six weeks, they're going to develop uh, hepatitis. Okay, so with hepatitis A, okay, again, it is transmitted via fecal oral route, and you need to know how it's tr um, transmitted, the signs and symptoms you're going to see, and um, like how to prevent it, okay? So, Examples of how Hep A is transmitted. Okay, it's going to be through raw shellfish, okay, contaminated fruits and vegetables, contaminated water or milk, and poorly washed utensils, parental. So, like, say somebody is, I don't know, I'm going to make this up, a diabetic, they use the restroom, they have bowel movement, they don't wash their hands, and then they inject themselves, you know, the germs could. Uh, potentially get in that way uh, and anybody engaging in oral and anal sexual activity is going to be at risk for hepatitis A okay so to prevent obviously hand washing if you're traveling to another country um, and it has a, a prevalence of hepatitis A definitely get your immunoglobulin before you go um, but don't eat the fresh fruits and vegetables and don't drink bottled water, okay? To prevent all kinds of hepatitis, patients should be engaging in safe sex. They don't, to prevent, they don't need to avoid alcohol, but they do need to have safe sex. After somebody gets hepatitis, it's no sex and no alcohol. Okay. Okay. So hepatitis A and B have a vaccine and immunoglobulin. Now the new recommendation is say somebody gets exposed to either A or B and they haven't been vaccinated is to give them the immunoglobulin along with the vaccine to help prevent them um, from developing it. But um, that's the new recommendation. So People with A and B hepatitis receive lifelong immunity to hepatitis. Um, hepatitis A is usually self-limiting, meaning some people don't even realize they've had it. And they, um, they you know, and they, because it, it could be like flu-like symptoms. Uh, hepatitis A is not going to have a risk of liver cancer, but Hep B and C do. Okay, so I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the assessment findings. The assessment findings are going to be the same in every type of hepatitis, which makes it nice, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about early versus late. So early they're going to have like flu-like symptoms, okay? They're going to have anorexia, a fever. They're going to have um, joint pain and muscle pain. So it's like getting the flu. So that's why sometimes it's missed. 
they'll have right upper quadrant pain and tenderness to um, palpation. Then they're going to, and they'll have, they'll be like so tired, right? You feel general malaise. Okay, then they have what's called the jaundice stage, and that's where you might see jaundice and icterus. They'll have that clay-colored stools in extreme itching. Okay, those, those kinds of signs and symptoms come later. Okay, so in your lab work, look for those elevated liver function studies I talked about earlier because it could be <clears throat> the liver is stressed out. And it could be uh, if, if, if they have obstruction, then they're going to have an elevated ALP. Okay, so for all types of hepatitis, um, they're going to need to eat a lot of calories. Okay, and so they need a high carb and calorie diet, moderate fat and protein, small frequent meals. Once somebody has hepatitis, they cannot drink alcohol, and some providers like make them wait until a year after they're healed. Okay, um, so they need supplemental vitamins and high calorie sets. So they're all going to be fatigued. So they don't really need bed rest, but they are going to have to, you know, alternate periods of rest with activity. Rest reduces your liver's metabolic demands and increases the liver's blood supply. So we want that um, to help the liver heal. So again, if somebody has hepatitis, no matter what kind, no sex until they, they, they test negative for the antibodies. No sharing of any personal items like towels, drinking utensils, toothbrush, um, call, you know, things that could transmit hepatitis. Don't prepare food for the family if you have hepatitis. No alcohol um, if you have hepatitis. No over-the-counter medications, especially acetaminophen. They're going to need to talk to their provider about that. And with hepatitis, okay, there's no need for a mask precaution. So um, they're all going to be on standard. If somebody with hep A is having diarrhea, obviously, um, make sure you do contact because um, that's the way it's spread. Now, I didn't go over how B, so hepatitis B is the hepatitis that has the longest um, incubation period. So in other words, B is for um, blood and bodily fluids. So how I remember that is B is for blood and booty call, okay? So <clears throat> it's more infectious than HIV, hepatitis B. So, but what can happen is somebody doesn't even remember how they caught the hepatitis B because remember, it can take up to six months before they develop hep B, okay? So examples of how this is spread, so you can kind of put B and C in kind of the same category. Um, so it's by infected um, blood products, infected saliva or semen, so not urine or feces, um, not sweat or tears, okay? Um, and contaminated needles, uh, sexual contact, obviously, perinatal transmission, and organ transplants, okay? So, in other words, um, blood, but not sweat and tears, okay? Not urine or feces when we're talking about B and C, okay? Um, but definitely sexual contact. Okay, so to prevent, again, safe sex, sterile needles, um, like hopefully there's like a needle exchange program if you have somebody with um, addiction issues who, who's an IV drug user. Needle precautions, and remember, to prevent, you don't need to avoid ETOH. But once they get it, no sex, no ETOH, okay? Um, with hepatitis B, the good news is that most people can clear the virus without taking medications. So that's a good thing because then they're immune for the rest of their lives. Um, and there are medications for hepatitis B and C. Um, and then risk of liver cancer, yes. So with B and C, they're going to be at risk for liver cancer and also cirrhosis of the liver. 
Um, hepatitis C is the highest risk factor for cirrhosis. Okay, so they all have the same signs and symptoms, same labs, um, and so same like type of precautions. Okay, so that's kind of hepatitis in a nutshell. Um, with hepatitis C, let me just say this. So it doesn't have immunoglobulin, it doesn't have a vaccine. The reason is it's an RNA virus and that's not what's important. I'm just explaining this to you so you can kind of understand. With RNA viruses, they keep multiplying so it turns into like a different virus, if that makes sense. So like, in other words, they can't make a vaccine for all the different kinds of strains that are out there. So if you have hepatitis C, it doesn't afford you lifelong immunity because the virus keeps replicating, right? And so I could catch a different strain of hep C. So that's what makes it difficult. All right, I'm going to go into cirrhosis now, and um, then what I will do for you is kind of compare and contrast uremia with end-stage um, end cirrhosis. Uh, you know what? I've been talking for a while. I'm going to do this in another video to break it up for you.